Peace family, it's your brother Mark Lamont Hill. Welcome to the first episode of Night School. That's right, Night School is a nightly show that I'm doing right here on YouTube, Monday night to Thursday night, Monday to Thursday, every single week where I will be covering some of the most important conversations that are happening in the world. It's not even really a show. I think about night school as an opportunity for me to break down all the different topics, all the different issues, all the different ideas that are going on in the world. Think about it like a big classroom. Every night we come in and we talk about all the things going on in the world. Now, I know some of you have been watching me every single night here on YouTube anyway with my Gaza updates. The Gaza updates are still happening every single night. In fact, they will be here as long as there's a war on Gaza. Don't worry. We will be covering that in uh, the night school program. So don't worry about that. That's still going to be covered the same way. But there's also a lot of other stuff that we're going to talk about because there's so many issues going on in the world that I want to make sure that we cover every single night. And uh, let's get started with it. Let's get started with it. Uh, we're going to start with, unfortunately, some news that we were hoping we wouldn't have to see. And that is another execution, this time in the state of Georgia. The state of Georgia tonight, as of 7 p.m., uh, put Willie, Willie James Pye to death. It's the first execution that's taken place in Georgia in four years. Uh, Pye was convicted of murder and rape. Uh, he was accused and convicted of murder, of raping and murdering uh, his girlfriend, Alicia Lynn Yarbrough. And what we've seen over the last 30 years, um, 31 years, um, has been an attempt by his attorney, um, his, his entire legal team, in fact, to get clemency. Uh, you know, one of the big arguments, maybe the biggest argument that his legal team made was the man was intellectually disabled. He had an IQ that was far below what the IQ of a person who should be executed uh, should be. Um, and yet this man, 59 years old, uh, was executed through lethal injection um, tonight. I'm waiting for final confirmation from the uh, from the prison, but what we know is it's, is that the Supreme Court uh, rejected his last um, attempt at clemency, his last appeal. Not just uh, the Supreme Court didn't re reject his clemency; they rejected his appeal. Uh, the governor wouldn't give him clemency, and as a result, we're sitting here right now with this person executed um, with an IQ score, I believe it was 68, an IQ of 68. And despite having an IQ of 68, from a series of mental health evaluations, this isn't hearsay, this isn't from his lawyers. Um, this is from independent people they've decided that despite having an IQ of 68, he can still be executed. This speaks to a bigger problem in the United States. And I know a lot of times when people talk about the death penalty, when they make a decision to defend somebody or to stand up for somebody or to protect somebody uh, from the death penalty, they try to find the person who is innocent, right? They try to find the person who didn't do it. And they say, look, this person didn't do it. And because this person didn't do it, uh, we this is proof that the death penalty doesn't work. And I'm saying, no, we need to focus on innocent people. We need to get innocent people off of death row because nobody deserves to be on death row if they didn't do it. But there's a bigger question here, which is, does anybody deserve to be on death row? Now, the innocent person is the easy person to fight for. But what about the person who doesn't have the mental capacity? What about the person who doesn't have the mental capacity to be executed because they don't know what they're getting into? We hear stories of, of, of people 
with mental disability so severe that when they're given their last meal, while they're eating it, they'll say, you know what, I'll just eat it tomorrow. Because they don't understand that there is no tomorrow. They don't understand that they're about to die. That also gets into the what we call the mens rea or the criminal mind while committing the crime. In other words, does the person know that they committed the crime? Do they have the, the means to prevent themselves from committing the crime? Do we want to convict these kinds of people? What kind of brutal nation, what kind of brutal institution do we have if we're executing people who don't even understand what they did, even if we don't like the thing? So, yeah, fight for the innocent person. But if you just fight for the innocent people, you send the message that the problem might be fixable if we just get more efficient if we just get more effective, if we just figure out how to stop the person uh, from getting killed who didn't do it, and we only can kill the people who did do it. That's what we start to think about. But I'm saying, no, the fact that we're ki killing people with intellectual disabilities, they should be off the table. And if innocent people are off the table and intellectually disabled people are off the table, and then we add to the fact that as a country, we get it wrong too often. Do you know how many people, according to the Innocence Project and other outlets, didn't do it? And yet they're still on death row? So if we get the wrong person all the time, if we are brutal and inhumane by killing people who have intellectual disabilities, if it doesn't work, it doesn't stop people from killing people, right? There are states where even when they have the death penalty, the murder rate's higher. And then there's the, the question of moral authority. Does America have the right after killing all those Native Americans? After a settler colonial project that wiped out all the indigenous people? After Hiroshima and Nagasaki? After the Tuskegee experiment? After slavery? After Japanese internment? After all the blood has been spilled from America for centuries, do we have the moral authority to decide who lives or dies? I don't think so. But unfortunately, Georgia will win points for this because they'll say the liberals are soft up north. The liberals are soft everywhere. But down here in the south, we get busy. We get tough. We treat people the way they need to be treated. We get rid of the criminals, we get rid of the bad guys. And so the prosecutors will get promoted. The, the governor will be seen as tough on crime. The mayor will be seen as tough. Everybody will be seen as tough. And sadly, it's just more blood being spilt. And that's something that we simply can't have. I promise y'all I don't have all bad news, but there is another story that I, that I want to bring to y'all um, and it's about these twin sisters, these twin sisters who were stabbed in New York City. Um, this is one of the stories that really, um, really shook me. A 19 year old girl has passed away after she and her twin sister were stabbed for allegedly rejecting a man's advances. Do you know how crazy that shit sounds? Even saying it out loud, I, I, I feel frustrated just saying that out loud, right? That two people, two black women in, in particular, um, were, were stabbed because they rejected the advances of a man in New York. He walks up to them, and by them I mean Samia Spain and her sister um, were at a deli in Brooklyn on Sunday. And the man walked up to them. He ain't tried to holler at one of them. He tried to holler at both of them. They're twins, and he decided to rap to both of them. And after trying to holler at both of them, they said no. They rejected him. The next thing you know, he leaves the store and then comes back into the deli. 
and stabs both of them. One of them survived. One of them tragically did not. You got two women who literally got attacked, got stabbed, one got killed because they didn't say yes to this man's advances. Now, there's a way that this story might seem extreme to y'all. There's a way that this story might seem um, unusual to y'all. Um, but it's not. The outcome might be extreme. You get what I'm saying? The death part might be extreme. The stabbing might even be extreme. But the actual sequence of events are exactly what happens every single day um, in this country. Women walk down the street and they get objectified. They become subjected to street harassment. They literally get subjected to street harassment from the, from the age of like 10 or 11. I remember when my daughter was, I'll tell you what year it was, it was two. Let me see, it was 2017. And my daughter um, was about 14, about 14 or 15. And um, she was asked to go to the store. And I remember saying, sure, you can go to the store. It's down the street. You can go walk. She was old enough to walk down the street to the store. We in the hood, though, right? And she picks up a book bag and starts to go. And I say, because my child can be absent-minded. I said, why are you bringing your book bag to the store? Your book bag's here. Just leave your bag and just go to the store. Why are you carrying other stuff? There's just something for you to lose, something for you to drop, et cetera, et cetera. Whoop -de -whoop. And she said, Dad, I bring my book bag to the store because it makes me look younger. And I hope that when I bring my book bag to the store, that fewer dudes will try to talk to me. And I said, what kind of dudes are trying to talk to you? She said, dudes in cars. And maybe when they see the book bag, they won't pull over. It, it had never crossed my mind at that point. It crossed my mind. I shouldn't say that. But I hadn't fully wrapped my mind around the idea that girls 12, 13, 14 are getting hollered at by men 20, 21, 22, 23. And sometimes they're not grown men. Sometimes they're men or boys their age. But even still... From the moment you are a, a girl in the world outside, you have to contend with this kind of stuff. You have to contend with men approaching you, men objectifying you, and not just saying hello, but literally aggressively pursuing you, sexualizing you, um, saying things to you, screaming things, um, demanding things from you. Now, that's just part of it. The other part of it is, what do you do when dude says, no i'm sorry what do you do when the woman says no because that's the other part of this right what do you do when women reject the demands reject the attempts uh to holler the, the request for the phone number the, you know and as dudes how are we trained to deal with this right i remember when i first started trying to talk to girls on south street in philly you know in the gallery in the mall that was really my job yeah you know i mean i walked through the mall in high school, you know what I'm saying? I, I had my, my my polo shirt on, I had my, my 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 fresh gear, my new sneaks, whatever, my Reebok classics. And you walk up and you try to holler at a girl. If she says no, what do you do? Because you're taught that so much of your identity and your manhood and your pride and your masculinity is bound up in approaching her, it is bound up in hollering at her. So you walk up to her and you holler at her and you say this stuff, you whatever. And she says, no, what's the next thing you say? Well, uh, or what we did was, you know, or, you know, the girl said, I got a man. What you say? Well, you know, we could still we could just be friends, you know, or, you know, I, I, I don't need no friends or whatever. I got a man. Boom. Um, I mean, I don't care about him. You know, we got to say something slick. We got to say something to respond because we can't just take no for an answer. So that reinforces a couple of things, right? One, the relative unsafety of women, right? Because it's not enough for a woman to say, I'm not interested. We have to keep pressing. No 
from a woman is not enough. So we have to push, we have to ask another question, we have to say something else. And then there's the other thing of it is that their no is seen as an assault on our pride, our, 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 our identity, our sense of self, our masculinity, our manhood. So I can't just, I can't be like, yo, shorty, can I get your number? Like we say in the 90s, you know, shorty, can I get your number? All right, nah, all right, I'll holler at you later. So then what happens is it gets toxic. Now it doesn't always get toxic. You know, girls told me no happened i went i went about my way right i still was a little salty but i kept going but i can't tell you how many times around the way in my hood or, or down you know wherever right in somebody else just going downtown like to like again like that the public places but definitely in the hood like if, if somebody say um can i get your number nah i'm i'm, I'm not interested they get called the B word or you wasn't that cute. No way. So a minute ago, I'm trying to holler at you. Now I'm saying you're not even that cute or I have to insult some something about you. I got to talk about your body. I got to talk about your face. I got to talk about your clothes. I got to say something about you after I just tried to holler at you because I need to recover um, some sense of pride and self. And the only way I can recover myself as a man is to dominate you, to to, to have some kind of harm against you. To have some kind of mark against you now i know this isn't um uh, and, and both the bunny just said this happens everywhere i agree i don't think this is endemic to the hood this is just masculinity everywhere i'm just speaking about how it played out in my experiences in the hood i don't doubt that it happens in lots of places because the male ego is fragile everywhere and you know white male egos are just as if not more fragile than black male egos so i don't i don't doubt that at all in suburban rural hood whatever like it's all there i don't doubt any of that but the point I'm trying to get at is sort of how this plays out. Because when you combine a certain kind of um, toxic masculinity in these situations, when you take that and then you combine it with um, a certain kind of hatred of black women, a certain kind of hatred of black women, which is quintessentially American, America hates black women. And black men are no exception to that. I'm not saying all black men hate black women, but what I am saying is there's a lot of black women hate in this country and in this world, and black people aren't insulated from it. So when you get that, and then you get the kind of um, culture of violence that often accompanies rape culture and often accompanies these kinds of situations, it's, it's not uncommon or it's not surprising that the same dude who says you ain't that cute anyway, or calls her the B word or follows her up the street because he's mad that he didn't get her number, now responds more violently if he's just a little off or if he's just a little more high, high, highly strung or, or tightly wound or if he just has a, a, a slight proclivity toward violence or, or, or he's not mentally stable or well or whatever. It doesn't take a lot to get from the everyday kind of harm and abuse and harassment that, un that black women have to undergo but all women have to undergo certainly in the world it doesn't take a whole lot to get from there to what we're talking about now it doesn't take a lot to talk about this and so i don't know the solution for this uh the short-term solution but what i do know is we have to think about toxic masculinity we have to think about unhealthy masculinity we got to think about um street harassment we got to think about rape culture we got to think about of uh, intimate violence and these is this is stranger violence right we got to think about all of that as we talk about it but it's not a surprise all right y'all there is a story that has been going around the internet all day because as always when beyonce makes a move the whole world stops let's talk about beyonce all right Beyonce has an album called Act Two, Cowboy Carter. It is the sort of follow-up to the Renaissance album. That's why it's called Act Two. And it is a country album. She's already released two singles from this album. And the album is coming out next week. But this week, Beyonce did something that she doesn't normally do. The last few albums, you know, Beyonce is good to just drop an album. You just look up the album is out, the art is out, the 15 videos be out. But she didn't do that this time. She actually announced the album, 
has an actual marketing uh, rollout and has now released the art for the project. And you see the cover art. Now, this cover art has a lot of people buzzing because it shows, as you can see here, the artist, Ms. Carter, Queen B, sitting on a horse wearing a red, white, and blue outfit with that cowboy hat while wearing what appears to be an American flag or carrying an American flag. Now, you can't see the stars of the flag, but it's very clear that in this in this uh, picture, Beyonce is is holding an American flag with all that stuff happening. Now, her caption uh, suggests that the inspiration behind the project came from an experience where she did not feel welcome. Um, my sense is she was talking about the 2016 Country Music Awards where she gave a performance and a whole lot of people felt like, what you doing doing this song, right? I don't care if you made Lemonade. I don't care if 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 Lemonade has a country song on it about your daddy. We don't care about that. Your ass ain't country. That's what it feels like. Well, the 32, can I say that again? The 32-time Grammy winner. That sounds like a damn computer error. The 32-time Grammy winner concluded the caption with, this ain't a country album. This is a Beyonce album. Now, Black Twitter, Twitter in general, but Black Twitter was very, very, very torn up about this Beyonce thing uh, in a lot of ways. Beyonce is always is being provocative. Beyonce is pushing the envelope. She's doing some stuff that a lot of artists can't do. Even you see this part of the follow-up with the with the braids and the beads and act two Beyonce, but the, the the I is spelled instead of the the O. And you got people buzzing about this. Now, some people are buzzing about it. I mean, you saw Erica Badu buzzing about it. Erica Badu was like, hmm, on her on her uh, IG stories. I think she was saying Beyonce stole her style with the hair. I'm not saying she stole Beyonce's style. I'm saying I think that's what Erica Badu was saying. It will be the second time. Uh, that she's accused Beyonce of doing something like that. But that's neither here nor there. There's a way that people were responding just to the aesthetic of it. And then there were other people who who were trying to make sense of what Beyonce wanted to communicate with this image of her on a horse. Um, the photographer, I think he's LA based, did an interesting and, and I would say a beautiful job aesthetically. For me, the question is politically, is this what we want to communicate? Now, there are... There are other examples. You can look at this right here um, where you say, OK, maybe something interesting is happening here where you're trying to harken back to a black cowboy tradition. Right. Um, other possibilities are you're trying to kind of tap into the classic Napoleon kind of the, the classic image of Napoleon. It, 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 it kind of summons some of this stuff. Right. I don't know what Beyonce was trying to do. I'm not going to speculate. I'm not going to say what she was trying to do. I will say what it conjures for me. In some ways, it's like Kahende Wiley. Uh, if you all know Kahende Wiley, Kahende Wiley will often show um, Black people doing uh, regal, royal-type activities that are typically reserved for white folk, right? That's kind of his aesthetic style. That could be what she was, um, what she was doing here. Um, but here's my issue with it and i know y'all some of y'all gonna get mad i don't want beyonce or any other black person carrying the american flag like that i don't rock with that now let me be clear i think what beyonce is doing is saying this is our tradition too the cowboy is there's no more popular no more celebrated uh, a, a representation of Americanness, of the American pioneer, of American uh, culture, of the American spirit, of American masculinity, of American violence, of American I mean, anything you want to say about America, you can damn near um, uh, uh, wind it up in the cowboy at some level. And so, the cowboy, if it's that quintessentially American, the cowboy also signals whiteness. And so I think what Beyonce is trying to do here is interesting, right? I think she's saying these are our traditions too, in the same way 
that y'all are trying to say country music is white. Black people started this thing. Yeah, you can talk about Kenny Rogers. You should. But you're going to talk about Charlie Pride. Right? You can talk about Billy Ray Cyrus. Fine. But you better talk about Ray Charles. And so we're not going to let country music be white people's. It's ours. And the, the as long, yes, there are white cowboys, but there's a long history and tradition of black cowboys. In fact, the cowboy in many ways is indebted to black folk and black men in particular. So when she says that she's doing a country album and people are pushing back and saying she's not really country and radio stations allegedly don't want to play it. And people are, you know, just like they did with uh, Old Town Road, which is clearly a country song, but y'all don't want it on the country charts. Um, y'all trying to say black music is just illegible in the country genre. Because of all of that, Beyonce is trying to say, this is our stuff too. I'm a country music, I'm going to take that back. The girl's from Texas and they're saying she can't do country music. What is that? When you got white men from New York making country albums. So she's like, this horse, I'm going to reclaim the cowboy. Cowboy Carter with the sash, says the sash. Country music, I'm going to need that back. And this flag that she's holding is another signal of reappropriation. And what she does is you don't see the stars. And I don't think that's accidental. I don't think anything Beyonce does artistically is accidental. So all of that I get. I think it's powerful. I think it's beautiful. I don't think she's selling out. I don't think she's uh, being uncritical. I don't think that she is just embracing American uh, exceptionalism or American patriotism in an uncritical way. I'm not accusing Beyonce of any of that. But what I am saying is, no matter how sophisticated your thinking is, no matter how complicated your analysis is, at the end of the day, she's still holding that American flag. And I don't want us holding that flag. Now, look, there were people on the Internet like me who were saying, look, this is problematic. This is this is all the things I just talked about. And then there are people like uh, Yvette Carnell, who's one of the leaders of the American Descendants of Slavery, um, the, the ADOS movement, and other people who said, look, we black. It's time that we claim our stake here. America is ours. We built America. America owes us a debt. How are we going to say that we're owed reparations as Americans for building America after being enslaved in America and then run from the flag? I get that logic. I don't agree with it, but I get that logic. I get that logic. However, However, the American flag in the popular imagination, in our everyday life, in our negotiations of the world, the flag still signifies, the flag still signals imperialism, domination, violence. The American flag all around the world is a, is a symbol of violence. It's, it's, it's either a sign that violence is coming or that violence has already come and taken over. And so I don't know if you can sanitize that even with blackness. When I think of cowboys, I also think of American expansion that meant to the colonization, the genocide, the cleansing of these lands of indigenous people of our native brothers and sisters so i don't want the flag i don't want the cowboy you can have country music you can take country music y'all that's ours black folk we should be singing country music but i don't need to be no cowboy and i don't need no flag and maybe that's why she said this is country music this is beyonce album not a country album maybe that's what she meant maybe she's on to something here but i don't love the aesthetics i get why some of y'all do although i, I suspect that some of y'all are just beyonce stands and she could come out with a clan robe on and y'all would still find a way to make this subversive and critical and powerful and y'all would be doing the single ladies dance with y'all clan robes on in the stadium for her next concert i think some of y'all don't some of y'all lose your critical faculties you lose your critical consciousness when it comes to beyonce so that's all i could say that said that said i'm going to pass on the album cover i'm not saying it's not aesthetically interesting i'm not saying it's not smart and complicated but at the end of the day i I, I, I can't I, I can't rock with it. I just can't 
rock with it, y'all. All right, there's another story I want to get at real fast. It's from Schoolboy Q. I thought this was interesting, right? Schoolboy Q uh, appeared on um, on Drink Champs, uh, and shout out to Drink Champs. That's my man, uh, you know Nori, who who I think is just doing an amazing job over there, bringing some of the most important voices and having some of the best conversations. But on uh, Drink Champs, Schoolboy took some rappers to task. He talked about um, the rappers who check in with local gangsters when they visit cities. And he criticized rappers for checking in with local gangsters when they visit cities. And if you don't understand, I'm gonna break it down for you. Checking in is when you reach out to people in the streets, people who live the street life, the gangs or other powerful influential figures in, street, in the street for permission to move around the city. Um, you hear that all the time. This dude comes to LA, he better check in with the Crips or check in with the Bloods. Or, you know, you go to Chicago, you check in with GDs or Vice Lords or, or, or whoever and you check in with them and say look i'm gonna come in it's your city i'm gonna move around. i'm gonna be in this club i'm gonna be in this spot i'm gonna be in this spot i want you to know uh that i'm gonna be here they give you permission to be there they give you their stamp and a lot of time you give them money or access to your shows and other things as an artist and what schoolboy q said was he said checking in is actually counterproductive because they don't know you and they don't owe you loyalty and they can't guarantee your safety from other gay people, rival gangs. So in other words, if I go into the city as a rapper in LA and I and I check in with the Bloods, that don't mean Crips ain't gonna try to rob me. That don't mean, you, you hear what I'm saying? Um, and I think he's on to something here. Look, I understand very much what it means to wanna move around the city with safety and I get why people check in. But I think a bigger problem is, and I think Schoolboy got, got at this point uh, on drink champs is that y'all doing too much just go to the city go to the hotel they're not the, the gangsters ain't up in the four seasons go to your hotel have dinner see a show visit your friends lots of shit you can do in the city but the problem is y'all be trying to go to the wrong places rest in peace to my dear brother pnb rock who's from philly from my hood or from the hood that I lived in, he's not from my, my original hood, but PNB Rock was a thorough dude, loved him, uh, had a lot of respect for him, um, got the rap to him from time to time. Um, and when he got killed over his jewelry, he was in the hood at a restaurant. In LA, they will rob you in broad daylight. They will line you up, you'll be sitting there as he was, right? You'd be at a Polo Loco or a Roscoe's in this case. And next thing you know, before you leave, it's 50 dudes there with their guns out to take your jewelry. And if you resist, they'll kill you. This is the real reality of some of these cities. But the problem is a lot of times these rappers or other artists who, who aren't from the hood, definitely not from that hood, still want to move to those hoods in ways that aren't necessary. You know, as a as, as a 25 year old, when I would go to a city, I'd wanna be in the hood too. I'd wanna go to their strip clubs. I'd wanna go to uh, their regular clubs. I'd wanna be at the parties that was around the way. I wanna be outside. I wanna be in the let outs. I will be doing all that stuff because I'm 25 or, or 21 or, you know, doing that stuff. But as you get older, you make different decisions, man. Maybe I'm just getting old, but I'm like, your ass don't need to check in if you don't go to them places, you know, I remember I used to carry a gun around the city all the time. And I still, you know, I'm licensed to carry a gun, but I don't walk around the city with a gun. You know why? Because I don't go places where I would need one. And I don't go places that want me to have one. Now, again, I'm not saying that good behavior or, or, or personal choices will resolve all of this. But as you get older, you think about this thing a little bit differently, man. I'm, I'm sitting here like, yo, these, 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 some, some of these young guys, man, I just feel like they're trying to get on and, and, and navigate the hood in a way that they don't have to. Some of y'all becoming Crips and Bloods um, at 25, 26 years old when y'all wasn't gangbanging before you became famous. How y'all, how, how you, how, how you joining the blood's grad chapter you, you know what i'm saying like chill just be you just be your artist just be yourself just be who you need to be um 
to be successful and not worry about all that other stuff. So shout out to Schoolboy Q um, for saying that. There's something else that's been happening that I, I just want to comment on just for a second. I'm a, I usually mind my own business, but I'm gonna say I'm gonna say something about it, and, and maybe I shouldn't. I don't know. Yeah, some of y'all y'all will tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong for this. All right. I want to talk for a moment. I want to talk for a moment about Robert De Niro. Can we talk about Robert De Niro, Bobby De Niro here? You you look at this photo and you might be like, oh. Look at Robert De Niro with a cute little baby. Maybe even his grandchild or great grandchild, something like that. Nope. This is a photo from February that has been resurfacing in the last 24 hours of Robert De Niro and his 11 month old daughter. Yes, let me say that again. What you are looking at right now is a photo of Robert De Niro and his 11 month old daughter now look they seem to love each other he adores this baby i'm sure this baby adores robert de niro despite the fact that there is 80 years between them this seems beautiful at the level of love right but come on man come on man I'm sorry, I got the wrong photo up. My bad, y'all. I put the wrong photo up. Let me uh see. Let me. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do that again. So when I put this up later, we can we can edit it. All right. I want to talk about Robert De Niro. Just, 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 just for a second. What you are looking at right here, look at this photo. This is a photo of Robert De Niro and his 11 month old child. You might've thought it was a friend's kid. You might've thought it was a grandkid or a great grandkid. No, it is Robert De Niro and his 11 month old grandchild. I'm sorry, his 11 month old child. Now, I don't doubt they love each other. That baby looks as happy as any baby in the history of babies. That baby love her daddy. And I don't doubt that Robert De Niro loves that baby to the moon and back. There is no doubt about the love between them, despite the 80-year difference. But here's my issue. And this has been an issue since it was first announced that he was having a baby at 79 years old. This is irresponsible. Now, I don't normally make comments about people's choices around reproduction. I don't care what you do. If you want to have a baby, have a baby. If you, as long as you're grown and responsible and, um, and it's consensual and it's consensual, who cares, right? But this is our business. And I'll tell you why. Robert De Niro is 80 years old with a baby that's not yet one. When the baby is 10, he will be 90. When the baby is 20, he will be 100. So given the life expectancy of the average human being in the world, and certainly in the United States, even rich and white and middle class, upper middle class, culturally, on top of the wealth, financially, you know, you make good choices, you go to the doctor, you drink your water, you eat your vitamins, you say your prayers, you can do all that you want. But at the end of the day, if you have a baby at 80, it is highly unlikely that the child will have a living father when you when he when he or she turns 18 and it's relatively unlikely that the child will have a living father at 10 or 12 it's just a fact this is just a fact this isn't me wishing bad news i hope robert de niro lives to be 110 and I hope he has health and joy and everything else. Just don't make no more godfathers. But what I can't just say nothing about is this idea that because you're 80 and have the ability to reproduce, and we could talk about that. That's a whole other conversation, right? Like the fact that you're 
reproducing with somebody young enough to have a child that means that person is probably 35 or 40 at the oldest so you already 50 or 45 years older than the person you're dating a little creepy to me too but again that's your business it's not for me to judge but but what is for me to judge i believe for all of us to judge is this idea that you're going to have a child at the age of 80 having a child that you know will not um that Robert De Niro had another child at 47 years old that I understood right having a child at 47 makes sense to me having a child at 50 makes sense to me again I'm not saying your child has to be 40 or 50 when they lose their parent right but when you have a child at 80, you are guaranteeing, for the most part, barring something extraordinary, at the age of 80, you are virtually guaranteeing that your child will have will lose at least one parent before they become a teenager. And that is selfish. And that is dangerous. Losing a parent is traumatic. I lost my father um, three years ago. And... I'm still scarred by it. I'm still hurt by it. I was in my 40s when he died. He was in his 90s. And yeah, you're going to lose your parent at some point. Some people have to lose their kid, at, their parent at 25 or 22 or 18 or 15 or 12. It's part of life. But it's a part of life that we, that we, that we, prepare for as a possibility as an unfortunate possibility that's very different that's very different than making a choice that almost guarantees that your kid is going to be fatherless that kid loves you and they're going to be fatherless sooner than later they're going to be five or eight or ten or fifteen and they're going to lose their parent because you made a decision to have a baby at 80. Now, yes, you're rich. You're rich, 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 right? You will make sure that child will never want for anything financially. I'm sure you may have a network of people that are supportive. The whole thing. I get it. This is not a normal situation. Although I know a lot of people in their 60s and 70s that are having babies at this age. And I think it's crazy. And again, this isn't about Robert De Niro as a person. From what I understand, he's smart, nice, kind humanitarian, has good politics, is generous, all of it. But this right here is some male ego shit. This is some not even midlife crisis shit. This is some late life crisis shit. Just buy a car. Spend a bunch of money on a building and put your name on it. But don't go around making babies at 80. That is, it's, 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 it's gross and it's selfish. And, you know, as Nicole Davis just said, men, let's be specific. Yes, this is some uniquely, specifically male behavior that is born out of male ego and male male selfishness and male desire and all of that. There's absolutely no reason to, to think about it in any other way. All right, y'all. I want to thank y'all for, for bearing with me tonight because, you know, this is, this is my first night doing night school, but we rocking. Um, before we go, though, as always, I do want to give you an, an update on what's happening in the war on Gaza, because this is no small thing. Every single day, every single night here on the Mark Lamont Hill official YouTube channel, I cover the war on Gaza. And for those watching this for the first time, we do refer to it as a war on Gaza, not a war in Gaza, not a war against Hamas, but a war on Gaza. That is because what we're seeing every single day and we... And right now we are on day 166 of it is a full-fledged genocide, a, a full-fledged uh, ethnic cleansing and depopulation of, of, of historic Palestine, but specifically of the Gaza Strip. And so, as always, I'm going to begin with the numbers. As of right now, since October 7th, 31,726 Palestinians have been killed. 31,726 Palestinians have been killed since October 7th. 73,792 have been injured in Israeli attacks since October 7th. 
And for those who don't know, the revised death toll uh, in Israel from Hamas's October 7th attack is 1,139. And of course, there are dozens of Israelis and other foreign nationals captured in Israel uh, who remain kidnapped and captive right now uh, under uh, Hamas. So we look at that backdrop and we say, how? How do we get to a place where nearly 32,000 Palestinians have been killed? And those numbers are even worse when you look at the number of innocent people who have been killed in this war on Gaza. Two thirds of the people killed have been women and children. 1% of the entire population of children in Gaza have been killed. One in 75 Gazans, period, have been killed. Two mothers every hour killed. When you look at how many Palestinian children have lost limbs every hour or every day, 10 a day, we're talking about an extraordinary, I mean, an extraordinary crisis. And the crisis in Gaza is compounded by the fact that it's also a humanitarian crisis. It's not just that people are getting killed, but the people who don't get killed have lost their homes. 1.7 million people. There's only 2.2 in all of Gaza Strip, and 1.7 million of them have had their homes taken from them, either destroyed or they've been kicked out of them uh, because of the violence, but mostly destroyed because more than half of Gaza, at this point, it might be at 60 or 70 percent of Gaza physically. The built environment, the buildings in Gaza have been destroyed. Every university in Gaza has been destroyed. Hundreds of schools in Gaza have been destroyed. 122 wells have been destroyed, preventing access to water. And so it's not surprising that one in four people in Gaza right now face food, face malnutrition and, 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 and famine even. This is the reality of a war on Gaza and it's continuing every single day. It is not getting better at all. Um, just to give you an example, uh, Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza City. This is the biggest hospital in all of Gaza. <sighs> Already in the last 24 hours, dozens of people have been killed because of an Israeli attack on Al Shifa Hospital. They raided Al Shifa Hospital on Monday. They argued that Hamas fighters had grouped inside the hospital and were directing attacks from inside. There's been no independent verification of this. In fact, I spoke to a doctor right here on night school a week ago uh abdul wahab abu warda um who says he's never even seen a member of hamas in the hospital they've seen no military activity in the hospital that's consistent with what the european doctors who worked in the shifa hospital said it's consistent with what everybody has said except the israeli government who has provided no proof of this and so when you see dozens of people killed, and this is why Israel's like, Israel says dozens of people were killed and that hundreds of people were arrested. Dozens, hundreds of people also were injured in Al Shifa Hospital. This is a problem. But it ain't the only problem. The, the, the Israeli military um, has killed at least 23 people uh, in Gaza City early this week, between Sunday and yesterday, or Sunday and today. 23 people at least have been killed uh, at the Kuwait roundabout, what we call it, a, a duad of the Kuwaiti in Gaza City. Um, then 15 more people were killed in a strike on a house in the Nusrat refugee camp in the central part of Gaza. We've heard about the violence. But again, I want to reiterate that people are also on the brink of death. They're staring death in the face because of starvation because of dehydration. We've already lost 27 people from dehydration. Dozens of children are being killed. And all of these numbers are lowball numbers. We talk about 40,000, 32,000 people dead, but 8,000 more are under the rubble. We know that they're likely dead. You know, it's almost impossible that they're not. We have 27 people dying of starvation or dehydration, excuse me, of malnutrition, these, these children dying of this. But those are just the ones that make it to the hospital. How many people do you think die that don't make it to the hospital? This is the profile. This is the work.
These are the developments that are happening in Gaza. We also see the harassment of journalists. Uh, my colleague, um, in fact, let me, there was something in particular I wanted to read to you all. Uh, and I think I just hit the wrong button. So let me, let me, let me, let me get it right. Um, whew, my Lord, my Lord, the, the level of violence, um, that we're seeing right now is unimaginable. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about, uh, before I get back to the humanitarian thing, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told uh, Republican senators in the United States today that Israel will continue its war to defeat Hamas. One senator said he's going to do what he said he's going to do. He's going to finish it. For, for Netanyahu, finishing his war on Hamas means a few things. It means continuing to raid the hospitals. We're now in our fourth day of raiding out Shifa hospitals we talked about. It also means, it also means um, invading Rafah. For those who don't know, Rafah is a city in the southern part of Gaza. Right now it holds about 1.5 million people. It's meant to have about 250,000. It normally has 250,000 people, but it's densely populated, filled with people who are hungry and isolated and poor and homeless and sometimes parentless with the younger people, the children, and they're in Rafah. And Netanyahu is about to do a ground invasion of Rafah by the Israeli military. Every major entity has said, look, this is gonna cause a humanitarian crisis, but he doesn't seem moved by that argument. And so Netanyahu is committed unwaveringly to invading Rafah very soon, any day. And so with that in mind, this is going to be a very challenging moment um, because there's going to be a lot more death, a lot more starvation, a lot more isolation. Now, there's also some talk of uh, reconciliation. Uh, Anthony Blinken uh, started a tour of the Middle East today. Uh, he held talks with Saudi Arabia um, with um, uh, a, a commitment to heading to Egypt. Uh, tomorrow, Thursday, to talk with Arab ministers there. Um, Egypt and Jordan are necessary people to talk to, they're necessary stakeholders. Qatar has been playing a super important role in trying to broker a ceasefire. But at the end of the day, it appears that the US government is only gonna do but so much if Israel is saying to do the opposite. And that is fundamentally the problem here, is that Israel has violated international law. It's, it's ignored the International Court of Justice. It has um, violated every basic and in, intuitive standard of, of human rights and of international law. And the only people who can really stop it, the only people who can really intervene in a proper way is the United States. And the United States has shown a, 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 a strong unwillingness to do just that. So we will wait and see. We will hope for the best, but there's a lot of reasons not to expect it. Anyway, we're going to stop there for uh, the day. I want to thank y'all for watching Night School. Uh, we'll be here Monday through Thursday. And on the days we're not doing Night School, we'll still do the Daily Gaza update. So don't worry, that's going. that streak is going to continue. But every single night we'll be here for Night School. Uh, we'll cover the hottest stories. We'll talk about the biggest issues. I'll be breaking down a bunch of ideas and we will also have guests we'll have live guests we'll have live interviews we will have um, all kinds of people who are participating and we'll do office hours where we will take uh, comments and questions uh live right here um and give you answers um by the way i want to send some shout outs here before we switch to uh to night school um, excuse me to office hours uh sadiq l just joined the channel and became a member i want to thank you sadiq l for joining we you are appreciated uh, Venetia David, thank you so much. She just gifted five memberships. I hope y'all are out there. Um, um, uh, if you're out there, grab one of the memberships, yo. They're they, 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 they moving off them streets. Bullet the Bunny says, we cannot take human life to repay taking human life. Talking about the death penalty story. Abolish the police state and settler colonialism. Congrats on the new frame up, friend. I appreciate you. Thanks for noticing. Young Coco Bud in the building. 
Thank you for joining the channel. You are appreciated. Beyond Ebony said, I'm against the death penalty because I just helped my ex and his brother get exonerated after 26, 25 years thanks to the Innocence Project. That's exactly right. Again, we get it wrong too often to have faith in the death penalty to do anything as a collective, to accomplish anything for us as a society. Um, and by the way, Ebony also gifted five memberships. Thank you so much. You have no idea what that means to me and to the channel. Um, Tonya, the creator, said, I re remember a 30-something-year-old man was still trying to push up on my daughter when she was 12. Ugh. Yuck. And then asked if he could have both of us. Had to pull up my switchblade on him in the mall. Any dude that said, but this is my point. Dude could be a creep who's disgusting, who really was interested in you and your daughter. Indes indefensible, right? He also could have been somebody who was just trying to save face after the humiliation of finding out that he was trying to talk to a girl who was 12 and didn't know. So there's all the possibilities. He could be into 12 year olds, which sadly happens way too much. Disgusting. He could have found out and then been embarrassed to buy it and then needed to double down and be extra hyper masculine by saying, I'll have both of y'all so that he could feel good about himself because he had just humiliated himself. That's not to excuse the behavior. We don't, women do not owe men any, any duty to placate their broken, fragile egos. I'm just saying the level of sickness and unhealthiness goes really, really deep. And it's something that we really got to figure it out. I'm sorry you had to pull out your switchblade. Hopefully you ain't have to use it. I don't want to know though. No name, no blame. Uh, Crooklyn sent a sticker. Thank you so much for that. Um, right now, before we go, I have time uh, for office hours. So if there is somebody who has a question uh, that they want to ask, drop it in. Of course, we give priority to members. We give priority to, to super chats and super questions. But if there is a question, I will take it. I'll take one question tonight for office hours. If there are not any questions, we're going to roll out. Looks like if we don't have anything, I'm going to roll out and we'll come back tomorrow. Let's see here, a couple of things coming up. Did you talk about Candace and the rabbi already? I did not. And I'm going to talk about that probably tomorrow on night school. But I, I've watched the first hour of, of Candace Owens, who ends up in a conversation where she's challenging a rabbi uh, who accused her of anti-Semitism and wrote an entire uh, article about her. It's one of those moments where Candace Owens is absolutely on the right side of this issue. Candace Owens is on the right side of this issue. Um, she's saying that it's okay to criticize Israel or to show sympathy, sympathy toward Palestinians. It doesn't make you anti-Semitic. And yet some people are weaponizing anti-Semitism as a means of policing the discourse on Israel. That's what she's effectively saying. Now, do I agree with everything Candace said in this interview? No. Do I think that sometimes she was being insensitive or didn't understand a piece of uh, what constitutes anti-Semitism and was therefore being insensitive? not knowingly. So, for example, when she calls a uh, rabbi Shmuley's daughter a hag, this other rabbi says, well, you know, that's there's a long history of calling Jewish women witches. And so this might mean something that you didn't intend, but you should still think about it. And she didn't. I don't think she took that in stride. I don't think that um, she. Uh, I think she squandered an opportunity at that moment to say, hey, I hear what you're saying. I still got issues with Rabbi Shmuley. I still got issues with Rabbi Shmuley's daughter. I'm still going to talk trash about them because they disrespected and attacked me for years. But I won't use that single word, hag, because I know what it signifies to a whole bunch of people. That's all she had to do. But unfortunately, she didn't. But still, on the whole, if I had to say somebody won that debate, it would be Candace. And I don't think it was close. I think she dog walked them. So, um, I don't know. But it's interesting to see watching Candace Owens be the darling of the right when she talks about black people, be the darling of the right when she talks about women, be the darling of the right when she talks about trans folk. But suddenly when she talks about Israel, they tell her to stay in your Negro place. Um, they're they're basically saying, as she said, you know, as a black woman, they're almost saying like she can't engage in self-defense. Um, and so all of this is part of the mix. It, it warrants a longer conversation. But, yo, I think it's really important to pay attention to um, how she's being treated and how she's being situated. Anyway, that's it for the night, family. If you want, hit the like button. If you haven't already, everybody in this room, I need y'all to hit the like button, smash up those likes, 
so that we can get uh, all the support and so that YouTube and all the algorithms and all that stuff knows that we're something that people want to consume. You can also hit the subscribe button right now so you can get regular updates about what we're doing, including night school, which will be every night at 1030 p.m. right here on the Mark Lamont official YouTube channel. And of course, if you are so inclined, you can go to uh, the join button and become a monthly subscriber to the channel. Becoming a monthly subscriber will allow you to get uh, not just updates on what we're doing. It'll also give you exclusive access to office hours, which will be members only a lot, most nights. Uh, it'll allow you to get access to videos and conversations that are members only most nights. And so you want to get that membership. And if you don't, but you still want to support the channel, all you got to do is go to Cash App. Go to Cash App and hit dollar sign MLHTV, dollar sign MLHTV. If everybody watching tonight, if everybody watching this video right now gave just two dollars because you enjoyed it, you enjoyed night school. And so for two dollars, you want to throw something out there. It would help us pay our bills. It would help us support our staff and help us expand our team. And it would help us build that uh, that theater. Uh, that I've been talking about and that studio that I've been talking about for our work. Anyway, family, thank you for watching. I hope you like night school. Leave your feedback in the comments and I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Peace.